All righty. Well, let's get started this morning as we come together to Sabbath School here at Bethany. Our uh, lesson today is coming from the 20th chapter of the book of Acts. <clears throat> and so as we get closer to the end of the book of Acts, just as a reminder, when we start the new quarter in June, uh, our uh, subject will be the first half of the Minor Prophets. That's what the next quarter will be. Uh, but right now, of course, we're in Acts. We'll be in chapter 20 today. But before we get into all that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for this day and for this time. We ask your blessings upon it as we come to your holy scriptures, the lifeblood of our faith. And to God, we pray that uh, you would encourage us as we learn more about the way you work and the way you work through your church. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Of course, we're in our catechism today, uh, Lord's Day 35, question 96. What does God require in the second commandment? That we in no way make any image of God, nor worship him in any other way than he has commanded us in his word. Question 97, may we not make any image at all? God may not and cannot be imaged in any way as for creatures, though they may indeed be imaged, yet God forgives the making or keeping of any likeness of them, either to worship them or to serve God by them. Question 98, but may not pictures be tolerated in churches as books for the people? No, for we should not be wiser than God. He will not have his people taught by dumb idols but by the lively preaching of his word. Now, you know, when we come to the second commandment, you know, probably two commandments that get the most pushback nowadays in the first uh, table of the law are the second and the fourth commandment, you know, in dealing with images and the Sabbath day. And the Heidelberg Catechism is much more explicit uh, than the shorter catechism of Westminster is when it comes to the images of Christ. Now, they teach the same thing, uh, but the Heidelberg Catechism is a little more blunt about it, uh, if you want to put it that way. So, the, of course, the second commandment says that we are in no way to make any image of God, nor worship him in any other way than he has commanded us in his word. All right? That seems fairly straightforward right? and fairly obvious as far as the commandments go. You know, when we think about worship, all right, who are we worshiping? God, right? So... Who should determine how uh, he's worshipped? God, right? Does, is God impressed by our creativity when it comes to worship? No. In fact, you know, probably the most famous example of creativity in worship is the golden calf. Remember, when they build the golden calf, they're not interested in worshipping Baal or the gods of Egypt. They want to worship God, Jehovah, who led them out of bondage to slavery, uh, but they think that they need a visible representation of God to worship him. Now, is God super happy about that? No. In fact, when Moses gets down the mountain, he you know, kind of throws a fit, right? And remember the judgment that God gives upon the people for the making of the golden calf is that they have to melt the golden calf down, and then what do they have to do with what's been melted down? They had to drink it, right? Now, I don't know how gold tastes, uh, but I can't imagine it's super pleasant, right? But the testimony there is, is that if you want to worship a false idol, uh, there's two things that have happened there. One, you made it. God didn't tell you to do it. And two, you're going to receive the judgment for worshiping a false idol. And so the first step is to what? Don't do it, right? That's the, that's the first step. So we are directly commanded in scriptures never to make a physical representation of God. Right? We're not to make you know, you know, stone edifices. Right? We're not to make you know, anything that is a physical, visible representation of God. So, for instance, you know, they have that uh, uh, you know, giant statue in Rio de Janeiro. Right? And it gets hit by lightning all the time. Uh, some people get really upset when it gets hit by lightning. Um, what do you think my reaction is uh, to when it gets hit by lightning? <laughs> I'm hoping that's the time it blows up and we can get rid of it, right? Because it's a false representation of the Lord. And that's what God does with idols in the Old Testament, right? And that's what God does in the New Testament with idols. Remember, um, I don't think we're going to cover it in our Acts study, but when... Uh, you know, there is a mass conversion uh, amongst the preaching of Paul. One of the people that gets converted is a woman who sells idols. And it's told to us that guess who gets mad 
uh, when the girl quit selling idols. The idol maker, right? And he comes up to Paul and says, hey, you've taken my best salesman from me. You know, why have you done this? And Paul says very bluntly and directly, because we are not called to make and serve idols, right? And so when the uh, Old Testament kings, the godly kings come into power, what's the first thing they do? Get rid of all the idols, get rid of all the Ashtoreth poles, get rid of the Baal statues. And so in the days of the Reformation, when uh, the Heidelberg Catechism is written, when a godly king comes into Holland, guess what the first thing he does? All right, he goes around to all the Roman Catholic churches and literally destroys all the idols. In fact, you can go to Holland today and you can see all of these medieval uh, you know, churches. And one of the first things you're going to notice is that it looks like it fell, it, it, you know, something happened during George Floyd four years ago, right? Everything's tore up, right? Now, you know, that's a riot we can get behind, right? Because that's a, a godly kind of thing where the, the, the magistrate took and got rid of the idols in the land. And the Heidelberg Catechism, again, is confessing that this is the duty of the civil magistrate to ensure that the people of God are not worshiping idols. Now, the question that often comes up on this uh, is answered for us in question 98. But may not pictures be tolerated in churches as books for the people? If you go into any church that has um, you know, stained glass, that's not like our stained glass, right? That has, um, you know, I'm trying to think of a church around here that well, I haven't been in many of the churches, but I think First Methodist has these. What's that? First European on a fair in Gastonia. That's our First European in Gastonia. Well, I, I was trying not to mention them. Uh, but, uh, uh, well, First European in Rock Hill has it too, but I, I, we won't get into all that. Um, you know, if you've ever been in the sanctuary at first, now you got me started. The sanctuary at first ARP in Rock Hill, you know, it's it's kind of like a semicircle, where and it has uh, you know uh, uh, columns that come down right to hold up the ceiling. Well, there's a certain place you can sit in that sanctuary and not see the giant uh, Jimmy the Shepherd boy that's down. <laughs> On the uh, front right. And so guess where I sit every time we have Presbyterian down there. But, right, the, the idea is for that is, you know, in a lot of those churches, they'll have like the passion of the Christ going around the, um, the stained glass, right? So you have like the arrest here, and then you have Jesus in front of Pilate, and then you have Jesus being crucified, and then you, you know, or you have the, the way to the cross, right, him carrying the cross. And then you'll have him on the cross, and then you'll have the empty tomb, and then you'll have the ascension, right? And the, the, the argument for that is, well, if people are illiterate, well, how, how do illiterate people read? You know, by picture book, right? So if you have picture books in the church, then it helps people understand things. Well, what does the Heidelberg Catechism say? That's not an excuse for having all that stuff. In fact, how are the illiterate to learn of the word uh, of God and what God expects of them. They're preaching of the word, right? The, the preaching of the word is the visible representation of God in the New Testament age. And so, again, that's, uh, again, the Kattelberg is much more blunt about this than, the, than in Westminster, but it's teaching the same thing, right? That we are to trust in what God has revealed to us is sufficient for the learning of both of illiterate and of children. And uh, we'll, we'll close on that before I, I get too much into the ARP side of that. But, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that, you know, all, most of the ARP churches that have that stuff were built post-World War I is when those sanctuaries were built. And that was the thing back then uh, was to, to, to do that kind of stuff. <laughs> but let's go ahead and move on to Acts chapter 20 uh, this morning. And again, as Paul is engaged in, um, in these uh, uh, missionary journeys, uh, we are now um, in uh, you know, chapter 20 where uh, Paul has completed his time at Ephesus. And, and again, matter of fact, what I just mentioned happened uh, in the previous chapter, Acts 19, where the idol, uh, the silver shrines, uh, Demetrius, the silversmith, gets mad, right, because... Uh, people are breaking the shrines to Diana. Well, now in Acts 20, Paul is, is leaving Ephesus, right? 
And as he's preparing to leave Ephesus, one of the things he does is he has a goodbye meeting with the elders at Ephesus. But before we get there, let's go ahead and read the first six verses here of Acts 20. Verse 1, after the uproar uh, had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And so Peter of Berea accompanied him to Asia, also Aristarchus and Secundus of of the Thessalonians, Gaius of Derbe, and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. All right, so this is you know, kind of the beginning of the story. And so the first thing we see in verse 1 is that after the uproar had ceased, right, after the riot at Ephesus had calmed down, uh, the first thing Paul does is call the disciples to himself and embrace them. Now, what is the purpose, you think, behind uh, calling all the disciples to himself and embracing them? Encouragement, right? You know, if you've ever gone through a traumatic time, right, probably the last thing you need is a bunch of people telling you how to feel about it, right? You know, what, what really do you need? You need a hug, right? You need somebody just to come alongside and be present with you, right? To encourage you, to remind you of the promises of the gospel, remind you of the promises that have been made to you in Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul does here, right? Paul doesn't preach a sermon at them, right? He doesn't give them a 700-page book to read, right? He comes alongside them, embraces them, encourages them, and prepares them because One of the things that we see in the book of Acts is that our riots at places like Ephesus, um, you know, an unheard of event. No, right? What we hear in the book of Acts is a bunch of persecution. We see these churches that have been established by the preaching of the gospel, and it doesn't take long for the pagans to get mad about it and to start persecuting the, you know, the, the new believers in Jesus Christ. And so Paul here is giving witness to one of the ways that the church is to help in days of trouble. Right. You know, w- one of the ways that we continue to do this now, uh, which is one of our uh, you know, announcements this morning, uh, is you know, the bereavement meal. Right. You know, wh- why do we provide a meal after a funeral? Well, that's a nice thing to do, you know. Um, right. But there's a spiritual reason for that right there's a spiritual purpose it's to show the family one we care about them two that we understand they have physical needs to be needs to be taken care of and three the bible almost always uses that kind of table fellowship as a witness to the comfort that we have in jesus christ right you see this in the book of acts you know whenever there's uh, you know mass conversions right what's one of the first things they do they eat right they come together in fellowship to encourage one another, right? And so that's one of the reasons why we offer a bereavement meal, right? Is to encourage the family in their time of grief, right? That's one of the reasons why when a family at the church is going through a difficult time, right? We go and visit with them, right? We come alongside them. We pray with them. We, you know, do these kind of physical acts of mercy. And Paul here is giving us an example of what that looks like, right? After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now, you know, that may seem a little, you know, not nice, right? He, he, he gives them all this embrace and, and says, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm taking off, <laughs> right? Uh, but, right, it might actually be for their benefit if Paul leaves, right? Because who's everybody mad at? But mad at Paul, right? So he's kind of removing himself from the situation to help, you know, the, the nature of these things. Now, after he leaves, we hear that he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece, right? So he doesn't just encourage the people at Ephesus, right? We get a sense that he makes the rounds of these churches in Western Asia. Now, where, where is Western Asia on, on, the, on the map? You know, where is that today? 
Turkey, right? The western part of Turkey, right? And so he makes these, makes this round, and again, this is a popular round to make uh, because it's likely he's visiting the same churches that uh, Jesus writes the letters to in the book of Revelation, right? You know, if you look at the letters that, Paul, uh, that Jesus writes in uh, Revelation 2 and 3, right, they follow order of the map, right? You, you start at one and you go around in a circle, basically. Now, Paul's probably following that same circuit. You know, we've talked about this before, especially on, on Sunday night as we've been talking about the history of ARP. But, you know, one of the things about the ARP, you know, before the 20th century is that we didn't have very many ministers. Right? So how many, how many churches did, uh, you know, Dr. Boyce uh, serve? Yeah. Five. At the, at the height of his ministry, he served five churches around here. And none of those churches were small churches. You know, at that point in time, Bethany had close to 400 members. Uh, you know, Clover started with 115 members. Uh, you know, that, that's the kind of church plan <laughs> you want to start at, right, when you have 115 members, right? You know, of course, he starts what becomes Boyce Memorial up in, uh, up there. You know, he has a hand in starting the Gastonia churches. While he never, while he's at Bethany, he doesn't pastor those churches. He's still involved in planting them, right? He plants uh, uh uh, Crowder's Creek over here, right? And you know, and he's also at the same time pastor in Smyrna and Hickory Grove. So imagine having five churches, planting, you know, one probably three more at that time. And of course, how's he getting around? On a horse, right? How's Paul getting around? His feet, right? <laughs> you know, and you think about the workload that's on Paul. How's Paul getting all this done? By the grace of God, right? You know, Paul doesn't have any kind of extra um, stuff in him, right? You know, it's not like he has a double dose of the grace of God, right? He's getting his stuff done the same way that Dr. Boyce got it done, right? By the grace of God. But ultimately, who's really helping him get all this done? Well, the Holy Spirit, of course. Right? You know, the elders and the deacons at these churches, right? Yeah, you know, it's it's you know imagine again if you have 400 members of Bethany, um, ha, you know how many visits do you think Dr. Boyce was doing in a year? Well, back then he was doing 400 visits, right? Now he was doing that. He would visit every family church once a year. Yeah, you know, but who's checking up on all those families every week? Right, the elders of the church, right? And, you know, it's not like Dr. Boyce could send out a text message to every member at, Beth at Bethany, right, and say, hey, how you doing, right? He, and really, Dr. Boyce couldn't even call, right? He had to physically visit with people to find out what was going on. And so it was super imperative that the elders at Bethany be actively engaged in the lives of the members so that when they had a session meeting, you know, the vast majority of time in a session meeting that Dr. Boyce had would be involved in receiving reports about the members of the church. And that's the only reason Paul's able to do all the stuff that he does. It's because as he's gone around, he has established these churches and he has seen fit that they appoint ministers and deacons. Right? It's exactly what he tells Titus to do at Crete. And so as he's going around, we hear in verse 3 that he stayed three months, and when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And so Peter of Berea accompanied him to Asia, also Aristarchus and Secundus, of Thessalonians and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Right? The other thing about Paul doing this is guess what he's not doing it? He's not doing it alone. Right? How many ministers are with him in this? All right, we, we got... You know, so Peter, we got Secundus, we got Gaius, we got Timothy, Tychicus, and Trophimus, right? All these guys are helping him in the ministry that he's doing. And that's an important thing to remember again, because the apostles never understand themselves to be above these guys, right? You know, one of the things that Paul says throughout his letters is that he is a fellow worker with all of these guys, right? So uh, the other thing that allows Paul to do all this stuff is he's very humble about himself. Right? He doesn't think he has to do everything. Right? He trusts the men that he's trained 
to do the work that God's called them to do. Right? So that's one of the things that frees Paul up to make all these travels. Now, the next thing we see in verse 7 is it says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to part the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And in a window sat a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcame by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, embraced him, said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. And when he had come up and broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. And they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. Uh, Yeah, this is one of the wildest stories in the Bible, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, There's so much happening here, right? First of all, right, what day is all this happening? On Sunday, right? First day of the week, right? So what are they gathered together to do? To worship, right? Now, we're told that, you know, what time of day is Paul speaking to them? All day and all night, it seems like, right? More than likely what's happening here is, is again, this pattern of morning and evening worship, right? They gather together in the morning, they break bread, which means they have a meal together, and then they gather together again in the evening for worship, Again, right? So there's this pattern of morning and evening already established in the New Testament. And, of course, Paul, you know, he, he's evidently, you know, I guess the term would be loquacious, right? He's a, he's a long talker. And one of the things we're told uh, is that there are many lamps in the upper room where they gathered together, right? So here they tell us they're on the third floor. Now, you know, there's probably a lot of reasons for this, but what do you think the main reason is for meeting on the third floor in the Mediterranean. Fresh air. Fresh air, right? You know, because what what's usually on the first floor? The animals, right? And on the second floor, right, you, you know, right next to the animals, right? So, you know, but also, you know, one of the things you'll notice, and I saw this in Mexico, but one of the things you, you notice in countries where it's hot all the time is where do, where do they do most of their stuff? On the upper floors. And, and what's the reason for that? Because the air is moving at that height, right? And, you know, and so they're up in the upper room because it's hot, right? And the wind's moving up there. The, you know, the, it's more open up there. And also, you know, it's one of the reasons why back in the old days when they built houses, right, they'd build those huge uh, balconies on the second floor. Because what can't make it up that high? Fleas, bugs, all kinds of stuff, right? That's one of the reasons why old houses had these huge balconies is because it was the only place you could sit and not be bothered by all the bugs, right? So they're all the way up on the third floor. Now, Tychic, or, um, this young man, Eutychus, right, uh, does he sound like he was enthralled with Paul's preaching? <laughs> no, right? Uh, it's one of the, again, it's one of these stories in the Bible that just confirms that it's authentic, right? Because... Does everybody need to know that Paul evidently wasn't the most stirring preacher? <laughs> no, right? Uh, now, it also tells us something about the wisdom of Eutychus, right? It, you think it's smart to sit in the third story window? <laughs> no, right? But where's Eutychus sitting? He's sitting, in, and, and I can guarantee you, how many times do you think his mama told him to get down from there? It, probably more than once, right? But, you know, what is it about teenage boys? They got to learn the hard way sometimes, right? Now, I don't recommend sitting in the third floor window and hoping I'm going to raise you from the dead, you know, after I bored you to death. It's literally to death. But, right, we see what happens, right? He falls from third story and was taken up dead, right? Um, but Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now, it was, what was Eutychus actually dead? What happens when you fall from a third-story window? <laughs> yes, right. Um, it, it, you know, even if he's not dead, what is he? Seriously hurt, right? Do you think he'd be up eating and fellowshipping after falling out of a third-story window? No. So even if he's not dead, he's at least healed miraculously by the Apostle Paul. But you know, we get a witness here uh, of something that we see from the prophets in the Old Testament. You remember when uh, Elijah uh, visits the widow, remember her son dies, and what does Elijah do? 
You know, this exact same thing. The Bible tells us he laid on top of him and, and his life came in. Now, do you think Paul's down here doing like CPR? Right? It's, no, right? Uh, that's obviously not what's happening. What's happening is that he lays hands on this young man and he comes back to life, right? We see, again, something about the nature of these apostles that they have gifts that we don't, right? That this gift of healing is something that Paul has and it's used to confirm the gospel. So, you know, in verse 11, right, they come up, they feed him, they talk a long while till daybreak and he departs. Now, we're, in one of the most understated uh, things in the Bible, <laughs> verse 12 says, and they brought the young man in alive and they were not a little comforted. Right? Uh, how would you react if somebody fell out third star window and the preacher raised from the dead uh, and all that? He'd probably be not a little bit comforted, right? But, you know, I, I think I'd probably show a little more emotion uh, than that. But that's how it leaves it. Now, verse 13, it says, Then we all right, went ahead to the ship and sailed to Assos, there intending to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. And when he had met us at Assos, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. We sailed from there, and the next day came opposite Chios. The following day, we arrived at Samos and stayed at Trogolum. The next day we came to Miletus, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying, in, uh, hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Right? So, a little bit of testimony of how he's traveling. You know, basically, if you look at, your, look at a map, he's basically going from one island to another down the Aegean Sea. Right? So he's obviously not on the express train to Jerusalem. Right? He, he's on this boat. And one of the interesting things that we take note of in this section is in verse 13 uh, and in verse 14, we get this, this interesting pronoun. All right. what, what, what does it say in, in that first verse? You know, you, you know, who's talking? Right. Who, who wrote the book of Acts? Luke, right? Well, who evidently is present for all this? Luke, right? You know, if you say we, right, you're talking about yourself, right? You know, that's, I get on Ian all the time when he's talking about his sports teams, right? Because he says, you know, we lost, right? And uh, I asked him what position he plays for the Yankees. <laughs> uh, right, you know, that ownership. Well, you know, Luke's present here, right? That's one of the reasons why we can trust what Luke has to say, because he's involved in these missionary journeys, right? So he, you know, they, they come down. Paul doesn't want to stop at Ephesus. And why doesn't he want to stop at Ephesus? <laughs> what happened last time he was at Ephesus? All right, you know, I, nobody can blame Paul for this. Uh, but, of course, one of the things we see happening is, um, you know, the Holy Spirit has other ideas, right? And this is often the case, right? I joke with people that ever since I was 18, I've been trying to move back to West Virginia. I had, uh, you know, where am I at age 43? Right, not West Virginia. The good Lord has other ideas, right? Well, Paul here, he wants to go to Jerusalem, but it's evident that at every point, at this point in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit doesn't want him to go to Jerusalem. So in verse 17, it tells us, For Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, right? So he's in Miletus, he calls for the elders, and they come to him, right? Because he doesn't want to cause trouble in Ephesus. And then when they come to him, he says, right, you know from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you. Uh, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, uh, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit in Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. 
Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will, will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch, and remember that for three years I do not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, <clears throat> brethren, I can... Men to you, to God, and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this, that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorry most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more, and they accompanied him to the ship. Right, so <clears throat> this is the details, of course, of this meeting that Paul has with the Ephesian elders. Now, he has some hard things to say to the Ephesian elders, right? And one of the kind of the threads that runs through this portion of Acts 20 is Paul's insistence that he has not held back anything from them. Right? He has been straight with them. He has been open with them. He has shown them the way, both by the word that came out of his mouth and by the hands uh, that God has given him. And you know, as we hear the testimony, you know, we, we hear, right, in verse 19, serving with the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. How I, was kept back, uh, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly from house to house. Right? The main people who have been a problem to Paul have been the Jews. Right? Why have the Jews been the biggest hurdle to the ministry of the gospel? They didn't want change, they didn't want change right? Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 you know, in another way, right, this is fulfillment of prophecy. Right? This is what Isaiah testified. This is what Zechariah testified, that in the day of the new covenant, that the biggest trouble that the believers would have would be the house of Abraham. And, you know, the reason for that is partly, right, that, um, you know, they, you know, that they don't like the idea that, uh, you know, Jesus came and got rid of the old covenant, or not got rid of, fulfilled the old covenant. All right? you know, they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. All right? They, uh, you know, ultimately though, what's their real problem? They didn't want to lose their power, right? You know, the way the Bible describes it is they, you know, were given by God a hard heart. Right? You know, their heart was hardened against the Lord, and that's part of the judgment upon them for their refusal to receive the Messiah with grace, with mercy, and with love. And again, you know, we get all kinds of scared to talk about this sometimes because, right, you know, in modern days, if you say anything like this, what are you going to get called? <laughs> yeah, you're going to get called anti-Semite, right? Yeah, if you start saying this. And I don't want to get into all kinds of other things that get me in trouble, but, right, the... One of the things that just happened in the last couple of weeks, right, is, you know, the House of Representative passed this law saying that you can't, you know, say that certain things about the Jews. And one of the things that is abundantly clear if you read that law is that it basically, you know, made illegal large sections of the New Testament. Right? Because one of the things that's listed in there is that you cannot say that the Jews killed Jesus. Well... What's the New Testament say? <laughs> she was killed Jesus, right? And again, the argument I've seen on the internet is as well, who actually killed Jesus? Rome, right? You know, because Rome was the one with the authority to kill. So we can't say the Jews killed Jesus. But what's made abundantly clear in Jesus' interactions with Pilate? What does Pilate want to do? Right? Could not find any fault with him. You know, he had wanted nothing to do with this. And, of course, what is, what is the symbol that, that Pilate does? Washes his hands of it, right? He even gives opportunity for them to free Jesus. And who do they choose? Barabbas, right? 
And Jesus is abundantly clear in Matthew 23 and 24 who's responsible for all this. Right, the Jews, because they have not received the Messiah. And, you know, so the, the danger that we run into here in the book of Acts is Paul is very clear that the Jews are the ones getting in, the, that causing the most trouble. In fact, if you go back, they're the ones who sow the seeds of the rebellion and the mobs that attack Paul and the other apostles. And so we need to be honest, right? But, of course, that's not where it ends, right? What does Paul say in verse 21? Testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith to our Lord Jesus Christ, right? You know, while, yes, the Jews are a problem, has God forsaken uh, the Jews? No, right? They are still a part of God's plan. Romans 11 teaches clearly that ethnic Jews will be converted in mass, you know, in the age of the gospel, and that the church should still be engaged in seeking to, uh, th to see the Jews converted. You know, one of our ministers up here, uh, you know, Dr. Lauderdale, Lauderdale, you know, that's what he spent most of his ministry doing, right? You know, he uh, was actively engaged, uh, not just in America, but in Israel, right? You know, in ministry to see the Jews converted and brought into the kingdom. And so Paul is telling us, like, just because they might cause an issue doesn't mean that we don't need to be spending time seeking their conversion, right? Because their souls matter just as much to God as the Greeks do. Now, as he is, is giving these commands to the, uh, you know, the elders at Ephesus, right, one of the things that he, he you know, makes note of, right, in verse 28, is therefore take heed to yourselves to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Now, one of the things about Paul's commands or uh, you know, you know, laws that he lays down for the eldership is that who is the first person an elder needs to shepherd? Themselves, right? You know, you, you know the, the overseer needs to oversee themselves, right? The elder, the shepherd, needs to make sure that they are walking in the ways of the Lord, right? Because... One of the responsibilities, of course, of an elder is to oversee, is to shepherd. And so the shepherd needs to know what a shepherd knows, right? You know, the sheep in this image, right, you know, you know who's the human being? <laughs> the shepherd, right? And what are the sheep? They're sheep, right? Who, who knows where the good grass is? Right, the shepherd. If you just leave the sheep be, what are the sheep going to do? <laughs> they're going to wander around and eat anything they can get a hold of, right? And what happens when sheep and goats eat whatever they want? <laughs> they get sick, right? They fall into wolves and all that kind of stuff, right? So the shepherd, right, is given the responsibility to oversee. And so the shepherd needs to know the green grass. The shepherd needs to know whether that plant is good or bad, whether those berries are good or bad, all that kind of stuff, right? So Paul is saying to the Ephesian elders, look, I have taught you all these things so that you can oversee the people of God because I'm not there, right? You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not physically present with you, and you need to be engaged in this, right? Again, going back to what we talked about with Dr. Boyce and, you know, everything pre-mass you know, communication, right? The elders had to be actively engaged in that work because, you know, especially you think back then, was Dr. Boyce preaching at five churches every Sunday? No, right? You know, usually in the ARP, at least how this was handled, is that a minister would have like a base church, right? So Dr. Boyce would preach at Bethany every Sunday. And then he would have a rotation where he would go to these other churches once a month, right? So he would preach at Smyrna once a month. He'd preach at, you know, Boyce Morrow once a month. He'd preach at Clover once a month. He'd preach at Crowder's Creek once a month, right? Well, who was leading worship in Dr. Boyce's absence? The elders were, right? Now, back in those days, you know, were the elders preaching in, in those services? No, right? Usually what would have happened is, is that Dr. Boyce would have left written sermons and the elder would have read, you know, a, a sermon by, you know, you know Dr. Uh, Boyce and that would have been the, the teaching for that week. Now, of course, you think back how much work that would have been for Dr. Boyce, right? Because what doesn't he have access to? 
<laughs> money, <laughs> right? It doesn't have paper, right? He doesn't have uh, you know a copier uh, up here, right? So what do you what does that mean? He's doing every week, writing it four or five times, right? Now, how would he get that from here to wherever? I mean, he'd probably mail it, right? He'd put, put it in the post, right? Or, right, he would meet them down at McGill's store, right? And they'd have lunch or whatever, and he'd say, here's the, here's the sermon for this week, and they'd ride back to Smyrna or whatever, right? There was means of getting it places. But, again, that was part of his work every week. And, of course, back then, how long was Dr. Boyce preaching? You know, back then, he was probably preaching close to an hour every Sunday. So, you know, in, when I, you know, I don't write out my sermons anymore, but when I did, you know, I basically could figure out five minutes per page is kind of what my, you know, thing was. So if you think about that, right, you have five minutes per page, and he's writing it out longhand, so it's not as compact as typing it on a computer. So you're probably talking 15, 20 pages of handwriting every week. You know, I mean, that's... <laughs> I'm glad I don't live back in basically the moral of that story. But, right, that's kind of what Paul's having to do in the book of Acts, right? He is saying, look, you know, there's not a whole lot of ministers running around, and so you all need to be especially on guard that you're protecting these people, you know, because, you know, of these various things. We'll kind of close on that, but, you know, that's, that's part of why Paul is so emotional, Right, as he's speaking to these things. Right? He says in verse 31, Therefore watch, remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Right? I mean, you know, I mean that's, that's how much he cares uh, about this stuff. Right? It, it's not saying he's effeminate and he's you know, easily you know, you know, brought, to, brought to tears. Right? It's, it's a testimony of his, how much he loves these people. That he wants to make sure that when he is not there, that they're being taken care of, right? Now, you know, again, as, as we see this, right, again, he, he says there in verse 35, I've shown you in every way by laboring like this what you must, that you must support the weak. And remember the words the Lord Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive, right? That's especially true of what the elder is called to be and to do. And we'll close on that. Any questions or comments? All right, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for uh, the, the, the word that you give us this morning as we look at Acts chapter 20, uh, the way in which, again, that Paul works, that he works by grace through faith, uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and through uh, the establishment of the institutional church, for God, that uh, the people of God in all these towns are taken care of by godly men who have been uh, received as overseers, shepherds, and elders uh, in the church. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.